Pastor Poju Oyimade is a senior pastor and founder of the Covenant Nation, TCN, a ministry founded in 1994 and the headquarters in Lagos, Nigeria, where he oversees a dynamic community of believers who attend any of its services every week or join it on its online platforms. He is a highly regarded teacher of the word of faith who draws out insightful lessons from God's word that are applicable to the complexity of everyday lives, family, business, and nation building. His messages are both transformational and transgenerational, finding relevance across all walks of life. Pastor Koju Oyemade's call to ministry dates to his time as an undergrad at University of Lagos and was ordained into ministry by Bishop David Oyedekwo, the presiding bishop of Living Faith Ministries Worldwide, aka Winner's Chapel. He has been consistently described as a bridge in the Christian community in Nigeria, a link between old generation of Christian trailblazers in the country and young generation. In this regard, he convenes three flagship events annually. The West African Faith Believers Convention, WAFBEC, an annual prophetic gathering of teachers of the word of faith in the body of Christ globally. The Platform Nigeria, a non-political, non-partisan national development fair, which holds a global media event on Workers' Day and Nigerians' Independence Day. The International Conference for Pastors, Ministers, Leaders, and Workers, ICPLMW, a capacity development event organized to teach strategic church organization and management and inspire the right values for the work of the ministry. He hosts the regular TV program, Insight for Living, and the Quantum Leap on various TV stations around the nation, Nigeria, and in the UK. Pastor Poju is happily married to Pastor Tonya Oyemade and are blessed with children. Ladies and gentlemen, give a kind welcome to Pastor Poju Oyemade. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, um, um, Pastor Tola. I hope um, you can hear me clearly. I think so. Thank you, thank you so much for the invitation. And um, I will just say a word of prayer before we get into. Uh, what I want to speak about for about 15 minutes um, today. Um, um, I, uh, first of all, let me thank Pastor um, Tola for the um, invitation. I, I don't take it for granted. I deeply appreciate it. Um, the only point of disagreement I think we have now is that, uh, except I saw wrong, but I think you're wearing a man sitting. Um, T-shirt, if I, if I saw rightly. All right, um, I'm not a supporter of Man City. I'm a Liverpool fan, but I may have gotten that um, wrong. All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to share. I ask that you pour forth your wisdom on my lips through the Holy Spirit you have granted unto me, that your words go forth unhindered and brings forth light into our hearts, clarity within our lives and establishes us in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so I'll be speaking on leadership about um, the burden of, of leadership and on the subject of getting people um, to collaborate, um, which is really the work of the leader. Um, first of all, let me say that leadership is a skill, and it's a skill that must be consciously and deliberately led. It is something you have got to acquire. Um, as a minister of God, I felt once you are anointed and you are powerful, then automatically, and God called you into a position, automatically it means that um, 
you're a, you're a great leader or you have a great business idea and the idea works in the market's place and because of the success of that idea automatically that means that you are a great leader uh, leadership is something that is independent of that and it's something that you have to settle down to understand and to learn that's why meetings like these are very important and crucial i'll give an example when we get into it moses was anointed a very powerful man he red sea parted and all of that but he didn't understand leadership and that's why his father-in-law jethro had to step in at a point and tell him that the management system he had put in place in fact there was none the way he went about it uh, administering his his ministry gifts and the callings that the success that his the calling the anointing had produced was actually going to shorten if he didn't manage it properly his lifespan here he was going to get tired he was going to be weakened by it and was now the success was now going to become counterproductive so it was jethro his father-in-law that explained to him um, leadership and moses was humble enough to understand and to uh, receive the uh, instructions that his his father-in-law gave unto him so leadership is a separate thing from you know having a great idea being a great entrepreneur who birthed a great idea in the marketplace or having you know talent and skills right that are remarkable or even an anointing whatever it is leadership is different and if we don't understand leadership we may even hurt the people that have been drawn into our lives by our gifts that have been drawn into our lives by our brilliant ideas and those things so it's something that has to be developed and cultivated being charismatic is helpful but that doesn't necessarily make you a great leader uh, first stage in life is that every single person has to get into acquire a specialized skill whatever it is and become an individual contributor in other words that's what marks you out point of entry into the marketplace you are a great individual contributor examples we'll give is moses that was individual contribution when he went into egypt and he was able to administer the grace of god as an individual the bible says they were all baptized into moses and moses single-handedly carried them we have david also at the beginning of his life the bear the lion it was only him as an individual he dealt with that he could play all right on the harp as an individual contributor and the demon departed from saul he could kill Goliath. there was no teamwork in that as an individual contributor and that's what puts you out so that's important developing and harnessing that individual skill talent whatever it is to a point where it brings you before kings it opens up doors for you you get into that space and place now where many begin to fail and they start struggling in life is when you'd have to go beyond being an individual contributor to a place where leadership and that's what god and that's why moses couldn't get the children of israel into the promised land because they had to go as a team and that wasn't managed properly uh, joshua had to come there all right and and because if he sent 12 spies if 10 of them disagreed and there was disagreement it wasn't just i mean i mean moses didn't have to build have a consensus to get them out of egypt but when he got to the promised land and wanted to enter into that that disagreement there uh hindered them for 40 years david after all that he did god said listen i'm going to throw you to the cave of adullam and now you're going to have people that were disillusioned in debt discouraged all types of people are going to come around and here is where you have to build your leadership in other words it is about teamwork it's about leadership it's about 
being able to get a group of people to achieve an objective. Now, the reason why the group dynamics is important is because what the individual can accomplish, one will put 1,000 to flight, two will put 10,000 to flight, you bring a group together and all things literally become possible when a group is going together to get something done. Uh, the example I use is, um, if, if th this is a, a, um, an object here, let me use this, which is much bigger here. All right, here is an, a, a pad here. All right, I have five fingers here. If I go this way at it, the impact is reduced because the, each one is acting as an individual. If I clench my fist here and hit it, the impact is much more greater than that. So we win as a team or you may lose by default. So you come to a place where leadership is now required. And that's what Jesus was saying when he said, except a corn of wheat, that's the individual contributor, falls to the ground and dies. He abides alone. But when he dies, he becomes fruitful. And it's that transition which requires an experience of death to certain things in order for you to step all right, into leadership is one of the reasons why businesses don't grow because entrepreneurs and people that um, have out these ideas and, and, and come up with this brilliant idea that I work in the marketplace, sometimes they find it very difficult to other people. They are used to getting things done themselves. And let me say this as a word of caution. If you are a brilliant student in school, you grew up as a brilliant person coming first. And this is why, you know, it says that uh, the race is not for the swift, the battle not for the strong by time and chance. All right. Because the brilliant person there, okay, comes first and all of that and is uh, reads alone, uh, does everything alone, gets into the classroom, writes the exam. All right has developed this mindset because it's the people that are in the middle or lower part of the class that are asking questions. So he or she is not used to asking anybody questions. They ask questions, they go and read with people. They try to get group dynamics because they need a support structure to be able to pass their exams and do all of that. And by that, they are developing certain social skills that that brilliant student did not develop because the brilliant student was just operating alone as a sole contributor. And so that brilliant student sees now these people that build consensus as the way and manner in which an average person in terms of aptitude and capacity goes about doing things. So they get into the workplace and he still operates as a lone ranger there and doesn't bring people all right on board and feels without knowing at subconscious levels that these people here. So what happens is they now have got to promote and they've got to promote a person to management level or this person has to build a business and take it to the next level here and, and now begin to scale trust, begin to communicate the vision to other people, uh, sell the ideas and all of that. Because this person has just been achieving things as a sole contributor, the organization, all right, looks and says, this person doesn't have the quality, the social skills to be able to move to the next level. And so somebody who was scoring, was coming 18th in a class of 30 or 19th in a class of 30 who had to build consensus now has the capacity that that, which means has the requirements that they need at that particular level because it's about, all right, social skills, uh, being able to persuade people to get into it and, and those things begin to be important. So leadership becomes a skill that has to be understood and learned. Now, when a very brilliant person, all right, falls to the ground, quote unquote, as a corn of wheat and dies and then emerges as that new person with a renewed mind, understanding that's why a lot of great corporations the founder with great ideas started and oftentimes the investors will say look 
we need some other person or another people to come and manage this thing. What they're trying to say is that good, you're a great idea, idea, and people struggle. Why, why are they want to cheat me? And what's going on here? But they're saying you don't have the qualities now to grow the business and to take the business right to the next level. So the next stage becomes leadership, right? You have to learn that, and that's what Moses also had to learn. He had to learn, uh, Jethro had to come up to him and tell him, this thing you are doing is not good. In Exodus chapter 18, he said, you are soon going to die. And he gave him the blueprint for effective leadership. And I would define leadership, all right, as the ability to get a team or organization to achieve a set objective within a set frame time. A leader is also someone who can take a failed individual that others will do away with and transition that person or transform that person, all right, into becoming uh, a, a very strong individual contributor to the team. So this is the business of the leader. What the leader wants to do is to multiply outcomes, to understand that one will put a thousand if we bring this thing together, we can scale this particular thing and multiply it there. And um, there'll be much more for every single person to benefit from when there's great um, leadership. So it's to multiply outcomes by creating synergy within a group of people such that power is released at a much higher level. And this could be intellectual power, whatever it is, it says for a set goal. I think it was UCLA, if I if I remember very well, uh, in Berkeley. They said, though, I, I, I heard this. I saw this on the internet, and and uh, a professor was speaking about this, and she said, look, the African American students were doing much poorer than the Asian, and so she tried to find out what was going on, and she realized that, and people came and said, no, you know, the aptitude. The Africa said, no, 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 no. There's, that that can be the point. That look, go and check their entry exam scores. You will find out that the African Americans, all right, did as well, if not better, than some of these other groups. Something is going on that needs to be investigated. And she started following them and observed them and realized that the African Americans will go and study as individuals, the Asians went and studied as groups. In other words, if somebody has an issue, they ask somebody within that vicinity there. They are all together, reading together, and they bring all right, maybe 10, 12 minds together in, in understanding things. And that's how they came out, all right, doing much better. So what is the business, therefore, of the leader? The leader understands that, listen, we will be able to scale what we are doing that is productive at a level and multiply in outcomes with even the same amount of energy, if this energy can be aggregated together. Okay, so what is the business of the leader there? And that's what the leader wants to do. It's now a skill set, all right? As somebody said in, in um, well, you call it soccer, all right, in America, it says, look, I'm not here to coach an individual player. I'm here to build teams that will win. Um, I have I have great players. What we need is a great team that will win. And if we look at Exodus chapter 18, let me just look at some so I don't skip that fundamentals about what Jethro said here. Uh, in, in verse 7, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, or I did obeisance, kissed him, and they asked each other about their welfare. And in verse 9, Jethro rejoiced over the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord that delivered you out of all of this. And Jethro, in verse 12, Moses' father-in-law took a bond offering, sacrifices, and it came to pass the next day that as Moses sat to judge the people, this was verse 13, he was doing everything by himself. The people stood by Moses from morning till evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why do you sit alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning till evening. And Moses said, because the people come to me to inquire of God, and when they have a matter and all of that. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, 
this thing you are doing is not good. Thou will surely wear away both thou and these people that were with thee. So after some time, Moses would just have faded off. And the whole thing would have faded off. And he'd have been wondering what was going on. All right? It was about leadership. And then he said, For this thing is too heavy. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken unto my voice, and I will give the counsel. And then he gave division of labor. He says, you go and be for towards God. Uh, take their courses towards God. Okay? And then he said, you will teach. And then communication. You will teach ordinances. You will show them. You will train them in the way they should walk. And the work that they must do. And then he said, provide out of the people able men. So the leader, all right, now has to get one of the skills he must get here is recognition of talent. In other words, being able to recognize people with the right ability to put them in the right places. This is so important, all right? Right ability, right places there. He said, able men here, you will get able men, such as fear God, hate and covetousness, place them to be rulers over thousands and all of these. And he said, this is what you need to do. So the first thing that the leader now has to develop here, because what you are doing is you want to take the vision that God has given to you, the idea and the thought that you have and that you are persuaded of, that you are driven by. You want to cast, as the first thing, that vision upon people, the group of people that you have selected and so you must select the people success and failure can be found many cases in wrong selection so as a leader this is a skill that was why when gideon was going to go to battle god said i will help you trim the camp because if you go with the wrong people there whose hands are in it, but whose hearts are not in it, you will experience failure. They will discourage the other people that are within the organization and everything will sink. So for, you have to understand that I must be keen on and take your time in selecting the, pro, the team that will be at the production center of what you are doing. In other words, this is the group that will be responsible for producing this particular thing. In Genesis chapter 11, the Bible says the whole earth was with one language. God never disturbed them. But once they got to a point to get this, that they got a vision and there was one. God said there's nothing these people have imagined that they will not be able to do. So define the vision clearly to the people leader and cast the vision. In other words, through storytelling, communicate that vision to the people. Let them understand not just the fact that this is what we want to achieve, why we want to achieve it, the story behind that vision, all right, and the driving force that is behind everything there. So vision casting, so it is clear to every single person that this is what we want to achieve in this organization and we have come together. And the reason why we have come together is that it cannot be done right by one person or it will take too long for one person to do it. We have to take 30 years. Or if we get a group together, we get this thing done in a year. So the vision has to. And that's why communication skills have to be developed. That's, that's why I said you have to have an experience of death. Death in the sense that you must realize that you can't become hesitant and say things like, oh, I'm a reserved person. I really don't like talking. And that's what Moses was saying, that he almost lost out on everything. Well, I really don't like talking. You have to understand the new skills you've got to develop. You have to be an effective communicator. In other words, you must be able, all right, to take the idea concepts and persuade people 
about those things. And it is through the power of storytelling. They are authentic stories that are told to people concerning that thing to cast um, them on the inside. Then again, like Jethro said, you've got to break down the process, all right, to accomplish. Um, or one thing we have to understand here about, about, about vision is this, and that's why our, um, let, let me give an example, Peter and John, they went and cast out, sorry, not cast out, they healed a the man. The man got healed, they were threatened and warned that they should not um, do it again. So these were Peter and John who were leaders. They went back to their own company. They had a company, which means they had a group. And they reported to their company. I mean, they could have said, we are the apostles in this place. We are, the, we are supposed to be the people of faith. We are not going to disclose our challenges. But they took that body and dropped it in the group. And the group came together and offered collective prayer unto God. And there was a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. And then we saw through Peter diverse miracles happening. For it was the faith of the collective that was in demonstration through the life of Peter. In fact, for the first time, his shadow began to heal the sick. In other words, and all that he did was that they got over their ego of saying that, look, we are the big guys here, and were able to transfer burden to a company of people, and the company lifted it, and they transited that um, particular thing. So vision casting is very important, developing communication skills. Uh, communication skills is much more deeper than me just saying something. It's the power of storytelling. It's telling stories that the people can connect with, um, which means I frame my words. I mean, Jesus did this throughout his entire ministry. Anytime he wanted to paint a picture of something, he used something that was relatable. In other words, he said, look, can you see how a farmer goes there? some of the most profound things in the kingdom of God. He said, you see a farmer that goes to cast his seed into the ground? He said, yes. He says, you know, there are four types of soils. They said, we understand that. And he spoke in the context of their own experience. All right? So let, let me give an example here in terms of vision casting. There was a gentleman who, a pilot, and he said, look, there are two ways I can tell uh, the people on the flight how much fuel is burnt, all right? at the point of takeoff. That the most of the fuel that is burnt, uh, used or by the plane is at the point of takeoff. That's where the largest amount of energy is being used. He said I could just tell them we used that something thousand these liters of, of fuel and, and all of that. He says I've told them, I've given them facts. He said, but they can't relate to that. He said, was that listen, we've just used thirty five thousand. What this means is 1,000 cars driving from the airport to this particular place in the city and coming back, the amount of fuel those 1,000 cars will use to drive from this city to that city, 1,000 cars, right? Amount of fuel will just bond on the runway to take off. Everybody understood the impact of what was being said because now it's had some relationship there with their own background and it was in the context of their own lives all right so vision casting and then the leader also must identify as much as possible roles that have to be played which is job description the roles that have to be played now you start out with what you know and it's very important about leadership you are going to take the education of the road and you are going to learn more as you practice you will never know everything in a boardroom. You will never know everything on the drawing table. Is as you get there, you begin to implement. You start discovering things. So it is important that you draw out at least a broad architecture of the work. And this is the work you are going to do because you are going to do this. Just like a football team. You are here. This is what you do. You are here. This is what you do. So everybody knows what they are bringing to the table. So you identify the talent that will fill and occupy those roles. Also, as a leader, you must understand this. 
where you have got to change things within the organization. That's why you've got to be, you have to be very emotionally intelligent. You have to change things because you can see that you've put this person in a position where they are not suitable for that particular position. They'll be somewhere else. It is important that the it is called the power quotient inside the organization is properly managed. Uh, you don't want to um, send a message through the organization that this is a leader that uses and dumps people. Uh, because if you, and that, now, it, that, that might not be, you're thinking just, look, let's do this thing, all right? Because once people perceive that we are not safe in this environment, in other words, erratic decisions can be taken at any time. What people bring to the table will be limited because they will be protecting themselves from getting hot, protecting themselves from being used. So you have to make sure that you manage it properly, okay? And if a person, uh, you realize we put the wrong person in this position, uh, then you may have to create another role within that organization. You can put that person into, and even if it's not too necessary, but you create it just for the sake of keeping the dynamics of the group, where everybody is 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 working together as a team and if that particular person has to leave the organization which means that maybe for some reason or the other then it has to be handled in a way that the others within that organization are not demoralized by the decision that has been made all right so make sure there is a rhythm that's what i say created within the group so that it is not just individuals that are trying to do things, but it's the sum of the individuals that are getting it done. You have to clarify to the people what it means to win. What does it mean to win? In a football match or soccer match, winning means the ball crosses a certain line. Everybody knows that's the goalpost. All right. And when this ball crosses the line at this point, we raise up our hands and everybody gets ecstatic. That is what it means to win. What does it mean to win in that organization is simple. What will make people ecstatic in the organization? That's what it means to win. All right. Be very clear as to what it is. It's very simple. What will make all of you say, yes, things are happening here. God is really with us on this issue and things are moving. Clarify that. It is one simple thing. But let it be clear to everybody within the organization. That's why when people are playing a sport, every, if you're playing basketball, everybody knows what it means to win. They know this ball has to go through that very small thing there, uh, basketball and get through. They know what it is. So everybody's eyes are on their consciousness is on that. How do we begin to move the ball together? Because there has to be a change when it comes to, to teamwork. I mean, if I buy a very skillful play, player, I'll give an example now, who can dribble. Now, um, I'm watching him dribble and he's being fanciful with the ball. It's very entertaining. He turns around, it's very entertaining. But if he comes on a team and the team has a chance to score and this guy starts showing off his or her skill there, everybody's going to get angry that this is not what we paid this amount of money for. We paid you, all right, to make sure that this ball gets to this place. They no longer want to be entertained. It's about the business of getting this ball to cross that particular line or go through this particular basket or go over this particular thing. They know what it means to win. So objective, what does it mean to win here? Everybody must know what it means to win, all right, within that particular place, so that everybody's consciousness is driven um, towards that particular objective there. Okay, and therefore, everything that we do within this organization or this place, collectively, all of our energies are to cross um, that particular 
or the ball to go across that particular line. There's nothing fanciful. Everybody understands um, what they are doing in that particular um, situation. Okay. Then another thing that is very important is you have to listen to outsiders um, concerning what you're doing. There is what is called the outsider's mindset that is very, very crucial in what you're doing. Now, there are two sets of people. Uh, there are insiders and then you have outsiders. Now, what changed the whole of Moses' ministry and his leadership there was that he, he listened to an outsider. And, and Jethro, his father-in-law, wasn't part of what you call core ministry. And we've got to be sensitive to this core ministry there. He, uh, uh, Moses could have looked at him and said, uh, what, what are you talking about? I parted the Red Sea. Uh, tell me exactly what you have done. You know, uh, there's an outsider's perspective. What exactly you have done that gives you the 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 effrontery to come and tell me how I'm supposed to run code my own ministry? An outsider has a perspective on issues that is very very important. Okay, because people that are, let, let me give an example here. If people have been going to a certain place, um, and even the walls of that place start, they start getting a little bit dirty, just a little bit, it's very easy for the people who have been going there to adjust to it. Now, it's an outsider that comes in that for the first time sees that dirt and is so glaring to the outsider which is not to somebody who is within an organization. So the fault within an organization there, or within a setup, are easily recognized, or even op opportunities, by outsiders. And when I mean outsiders, people that are not, may not even be in your own industry, may not have your own viewpoint on life, uh, that just come in and look at it and, and say, Look, why, why don't you do things this way? Okay. I mean, I, I give this example. My mother came to when I started church and I was preaching and all of that. The church wasn't growing. And my mother came and she had never heard me preach. She sat in the midweek service. Well, about 30 people, maybe 30, 40 people. She listened and she left. And three months later, I went to see her in the city where she was. And she laughed. She called my father. She said, your son can preach. Have you heard him? He really can preach. And my father said, is that so? He said, you should go and hear it. She said, well, but you have a problem. I said, what? She said, there should be more people in that your church than the people that are there based on what you preach. And she said to me, and this was an outsider's perspective, I actually think that's the first time my mother entered a Pentecostal church in her life. And she said, why don't you go on television? That if people know what you are saying, more people come to that church, go on television. And I was like, listen, you can't tell me what you know. I mean, in my mind, I mean, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. It's about anointing, you know. I'm not even sure you're born again, you know, and all of that. And I, I left her. Seven years later, I went on television. Seven years later, the church within the space of five months tripled in size. We had to start breaking walls. So when my mother came, she said, but I told you this thing seven years ago. You didn't listen to me. Now, that's the outsider's perspective. An outsider's perspective in what you are doing is such a powerful thing, right? If you are going home, just say this here, and you're going with people that are very close to you, close family, tight friends, whether your living room is not intact, it doesn't really matter. You know, we all come in and just laugh about it because they are used to that condition. But if it's a stranger you are bringing, you will call home that listen, make sure everything is tight. There's the there's what the outsider does on the consciousness of a person there that is very important. So have a way in which you gain feedback from the outsiders, people that have experiences in places that are different, or how you even glean wisdom and insight, all right, from um, the outsiders um, that are there. 
Also, it is important that as something begins to work and it begins to grow, uh, the greatest, the greatest challenge or threat, that's the word, to anything is not adversity, is actually distraction. So it is important that the people begin to get distracted. Right? They start getting distracted there and going into other things. Um, because they are, you now have the capacity to be able to do things you didn't have the capacity to do. So the tendencies in people right now begin to come out. Okay? Um, so you know, people start coming out with programs that may not be directly connected to the fulfillment of that particular vision. You have to be conscious of this. Uh, people can come out all right with that. So it has to be clear within the culture of the organization here. Uh, one of the things I tell people is that if you want us to do something new within this place tell me what you are willing to give up which means let's this is how you test the authenticity of it what dies for this to come alive so let's assume that we are doing this particular thing and say okay i think we should do this and okay so what do we stop doing all right to in order for us to be able to do this so what do you mean all right we're not just going to begin to pack things together what do you think if you really believe this thing will achieve so much what will we give up to do that? Because people get distracted. Possibilities begin to come, particularly in church work, where there is nothing like return on investment. Okay, and people just feel that you know you can uh, spend money on this, and this person comes with that idea, and these are good ideas, but they are not um, uh, the right idea for the organization at that particular point in time. So. People shouldn't get distracted by fanciful things uh, um, that they might now get engaged in and with, but they stay focused upon the very things that we're doing. Also, um, it, is, it, is, it is the most powerful thing and healthy thing for as the organization grows that the leadership core all right, remains the same. That's the most healthy thing. In other words, they are growing because um, there are dimensions to that thing of trust, of loyalty that cannot be built, all right, through somebody having skill or, or talent and all of that. So you want that. But that leadership core must have, must be told you have to have a culture of innovation, a culture of openness and a solid feedback system and also within the entire organization the culture of feedback must be there i mean i tell people within the church that you can say i'm the head now now the whole body is the team so i'm the head but that's all i am but the fingers there can feel whether something is hot or not now, what happens in the body is that when the fingers touch a plate and it's hot, it sends a signal back to the head, immediately saying, this thing is hot, and then the head sends a signal back, and then the fingers are removed from it. That happens fast. So it goes bam and comes back. Now, in an organization, what will kill that organization or what will bring about a decline? Somebody felt it somewhere. Somebody heard a conversation. Somebody saw something somewhere. Somebody noticed something somewhere. And because they did not give the feedback to the decision making body, all right, or person there, then that thing begins to die at that particular point. So, decisions. Now, the problem that can be had with um, um, older leadership people is people are reluctant to accept. Uh, uh, an idea that might change the power equation within that particular organization. And so I think 
people have to be um, given some assurances is the culture, all right, of this place and that it won't threaten, all right, because what people have within um, that thing is more than what can be bought. I mean, I told staff in the office, I just looked around when I hired them, some of them were in their 20s, early 20s. Now they are getting to 40, they are getting to 38. They're get, I mean, they're getting old and all of that. And I keep saying young. I said, I've got to go and get young people, in, all right, because we need fresh ideas in this place. And then they tell me, hey, Pastor, you know, these young, young people, uh, we are the ones that are loyal. I said, I will not question your loyalty, and therefore you remain, all right, as a wall around me. However, it is important that we have to be able to tap into what is going in the next generation. And the same way we brought you guys on board, we have to bring these people on board. Now, the things that I did for you, you guys are the ones that, so they said, okay, we understand what you're saying. So it's about vision casting, explaining to people, and making people all right understand um, 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 what is going on. Also, it's important from time to time, and that's the data gathering, to make sure that no assumptions are being made um, in the leadership there. People are not just making assumptions of all things, um, 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 that data is being gotten from people, all right, and um, that, that data is being processed. And then finally, all right, you have to manage yourself to total um, victory. In other words, you have to manage. Uh, as you start implementing things, you begin to get real feedback concerning the things that you are doing, how it is working, and you must be ready all right, to handle the fact that I felt this idea was brilliant, all right, and I felt it was a brilliant idea, but this thing isn't working the way we think, and you begin to think of it um, until you get a perfect interpretation of the very thing that you have in your mind, and it's been implemented correctly, all right? So the leader has to experience death when it comes to the approach as a sole contributor has to experience that, and God had to take his people he used through that, and therefore emerges now and saying, this is a new wave of leadership. Um, what I want to do here, at some stage, you're a player coach. When I say player coach, you are demonstrating things to people. At the same time, you are coaching people. A lot of training is going on where you are passing across to the people relevant skills and the one you don't have. You are getting people who can get relevant skills and knowledge to them so that each person's life improves. People are given tasks that will expand them and grow them bigger than anything all right, that they have ever done. Anybody within your team should be stretched. Okay. It has to be a culture. In other words, when I say stretch now, which means that you can't be, you have to throw something on your table that will make you achieve more. Uh, people may struggle, but they make them a better person, acquire new skills, and do things. Then the rhythm of the organization there must be also watched, managed properly. All right? You win as a team or you lose as by default. If you come together as a team, you will win. So your business is to build that team. Your business is to sit with them. Your business is to be in the trenches with them. Your business is to understand all of that and build the rhythm that is within the organization. By clarifying what it means to win, it must be clear to everybody at every level there what it means to win in this place and where do we win, all right? Where do we win? Uh, you, uh, you win the ball crosses the line, it's in the goal post. So an organization, where do we win? At what point do we actually cross the line? You think clearly concerning. Because clarity of thought, all right, so everybody brings focused consciousness. Focused consciousness there is almost 75% because with fo focused consciousness comes creative ideas on how to get it done. And the reason why people can focus on something is because it has been clarified to them. They know clearly what it means, all right, to wait. 
Don't get distracted by fanciful things. Take deliberate steps to achieve. A lot of things that will be done to achieve the goal won't be fanciful, won't be in the public eye, but these are solid steps we must take, all right, to achieving this particular um, goal there. And um, then again, delegation, recognition of talent, and then delegation there of talent, and knowing how to manage, all right, the emotions of people where the arrangements have got to be made because we realize that uh, you'll be better positioned in a certain place. And then the core team must also be so that they don't get into a place where they feel entitled. That length of time within a certain organization is the basis for reward and no longer just your contribution to that organization. Because if length of time becomes the issue, it means the longer they stay within the place, the more they're going to develop an entitlement mentality and they may no longer going to be contributing anything. And it's all about storytelling about what happened, all right, 25 years ago and 20 years. So innovation has to be part and parcel of the culture. Don't forget that, listen, people that have been in the trenches with you for years, all right, it's very important that you recognize those people and that um, you cannot pay for loyalty you can't buy loyalty. Loyalty cannot be bought. Um, and so um, 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 that has to be recognized in anything um, that you are doing. And also it is very important that that's why the Bible says let the wheat and tears grow together. That if you go and take the tears out prematurely, what happens is that the wheat will also go. In other words, if something is not yet apparent to everybody, the the why this person can no longer be in this particular place. And you, it's only apparent to you as a leader and you remove that person from that place. You may send a signal to other people that, because they haven't seen it, that. So you have to wait until the time where it now becomes apparent and it was okay, this is no longer right. So you manage and curtail it, all right, until it becomes apparent to people. So there has to be a lot of emotional intelligence in what you're doing. And you've got to understand the dynamics there um, of human nature and to balance the way them, all right, that is there. But the win has to be clarified there. Um, everybody must know what they are doing. The architecture has to be very clear. This is the role you are playing. This is what we want you to accomplish in this place as an individual, as a team here. What you do here is going to be connected to this person here. And this is how we're going to build it. It's a system that we have built. And here is the structure which means the positions that we have created so that this system will be able to achieve this particular um, objective here. If you drop your ball, it's going to affect, all right, people in that place. And of course, we must make sure that there's feedback coming out and also listen to outsiders. Outsiders are different from mentors. Mentors are people that you have a relationship study with, you talk to them, they cancel. An outsider can be somebody who just walked into your life and they may not, you may not even see them again. And they come in and they just say something to you and that thing can be game changing there. So you must keep your ears open. Somebody will always come and in just one conversation and bring a major breakthrough idea for that organization. And many times we've seen it comes from what we call outsiders, all right? So just come with fresh perspective fresh eyes. And I believe that that's why America became such a great nation through immigrants. What they understood was that if we bring outsiders into a country, they have a different perspective to things and therefore they are going to bring something to the table that insiders, all right, will not. So the insiders therefore have a role of drawing the outsiders into the culture, into the constitution, into the manner, into the way of life of that. They are protectors of the culture. But these outsiders come in with things here that we may not be able to find with people on the uh, inside. All right, if um, you were blessed by that. Um, I, I must say that I, I also agree with you that you are a, a great teacher. 
you know, uh, I can never forget the first time I had you. Uh, oh my goodness, this guy is good. He's good at what he does. And um, many times people talk to me about Covenant Nation. I say, oh, look at that they are going. And they try to compare. I said, Pastor Paul is different because he's deep uh, and uh, he's a good teacher. These are things that will set behind you that I'm not saying in front of you. You know, you are a good teacher, no doubt. And uh, I can listen to you all day long. And honestly, that's just the truth. I can listen to you all day long. You know, so once again, we want to thank you. I appreciate you. Um, because you commented about the Manchester City, that was why I had to take off the jacket so that you can fully see now because you don't argue with results. We don't argue with results. Uh, so let's leave that one now. <laughs> you know, leave that one. You know uh, I, I used to follow a particular football club and uh, uh, when they kept on losing, you know, and at a point even last year, people thought they were going to win, you know, I'm not mentioning names, but eventually they couldn't uh, close the deal. But that's all right. That's all right. Let's talk leadership, you know, today. We have so many questions to ask you. And um, please uh, bear with us. Uh, the first question is that how, how do you promote, you know, cultural collaboration and teamwork across different age brackets within an organization? Do you understand? How, how do you do this? Because, um, in fact, it's only today that I realized that your church started 29 years ago. That's a long time. That's a long time. And a lot of people don't know that you've been around for that long. So all they see today are the youths coming to your church. And, and you mentioned a little bit about it with the older people that have been there. So how do you collaborate both age brackets to be able to work together within the church con context? All right. Um, this, is, this is how I see it. Um, a community is a mosaic of what I would call homogeneous groups. What homogeneous groups are people who at a similar stage within their lives wanting to accomplish um, similar goals. And it's when people are put into those homogeneous groups that they perform best. In other words, if you put teenagers together and, and they're, they're together with themselves, they perform, all right, they, they come alive. Uh, you put, um, let's say women, let's just say women in business between a certain age group or startup, they come alive. So what we do is that as much as we have um, different generations, each of those generations, um, we try as much as possible that they, they have their own community within the larger community. And so they grow at that particular. So for example, we had an Afro gospel concert where i mean i told the older people in church who i went there for they said look you guys this thing i will invite them when and these people for you people that this one is not the kind of place i said they're coming pastor will come all right when they got there for the first time in the church there were no chairs right it was a runway um, um the, the people came out the teenagers uh, even people 11 year old all surrounded it Somebody looked around and said ah, that if you do this every Friday, the nightclubs in Lagos will be empty because people came in, we gave them uh, glasses with the word lights, everything. It looked like a concert. And then we brought people in and those wrong. So, so they have their own and then we do that. And then we now have what we call our general meetings where those homogeneous groups, but each of the groups has to be given their own identity within that so that they can grow all right at that particular level and so they can invite people into the church because they understand that um, there is a community for them and that there is a way and manner in which they can relate and develop themselves um, within each of those communities so we, we build communities within the larger framework there uh, where even though you belong to that bigger body there is a point at which you enter into the organization and you you do things all right together and what that has done is that people tell me that look i mean i i left a, the women's program now to rush to come back here to uh to do this 
and they were there and that was on a panel and so i quickly came back and people tell me ah, you are doing so but the truth about the matter is that it looks like i'm doing a lot but because these homogeneous groups are together doing stuff um all that happens is i just give an overview of what i think and maybe just advise them on one or two things but they run but once you take people um in a homogeneous group and put them together bam, they just they just they they and then they win people at that point i mean is the strategy that was used in what we call full gospel businessmen in other words they created a homogeneous group and once it was full gospel businessmen they found it very easy to invite businessmen to that meeting all right and then the businessmen can enter into a larger body organization there and what they have their uh, community so so that's what we do we we uh, as a church i realized that we got to a place where i just looked around the church and i uh, i looked at the photographs one day of all the church and i felt we had too many gray hairs in the church and this wasn't how the church was all right 15 years ago so i sat down and said uh, you know, we have to go for the younger generation we have to create and i said the only way is they must have full representation within the church in terms of expression and um, um, because 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 we have muscle now so we can give them the infrastructure to be able to express themselves and so that's the way we do it so we recognize homogeneous groups um, that are there all right and i don't think there's any homogeneous group that is not represented in the church even up to people that want to lose weight they have their group so each person can identify with that so you can be a woman let's assume you're a lawyer right there's a homogeneous group for lawyers and then you can also have a human so you can belong to i want to lose weight but i'm a lawyer so we created that and we realized that if that was like birds of the same feather flock together it's in nature so if we create that people are going to begin to work together and that becomes it I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I, okay. I was okay, muted, so I, I, I forgot. No. One other thing that comes to my mind is that how do you uh, reconcile two or many departments in the organization to make them to focus on a global vision of the church that is to work together rather than a department being seen as being in competition with another because one is trying to outshine the other how are you able to do this that's a question from someone who practices it because it is a it is an issue that really happens that is very funny that um, the department on um, on um, visuals can be in competition with sound to the point where when the visuals are played, the sound is out and then you are looking at the appointed. Well, so the only, the only way I can do that is, is training, 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 training and getting people to see that, look, um, 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 more will be achieved. It's, it's really renewal of the mind because th those guys are looking at themselves as sole contributors. My business is just to make sure that the sound comes out. This person business, my business is to make sure that the visuals come out. So it is about training and making people and they change because it is actually an experience of death within for people to be able to work together harmoniously on an issue. I mean, ego has to be set aside. And the only way that can be done is by communicating and communicating and then communicating and communicating again. That's the only way you can do it. Okay, okay. I, 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 I love your answer. One of the things that we've had to do here is that we just made sure that we have one pastor for those two departments that you've mentioned. Do you understand? Which means there is one global leader, even though there are different HODs, and that global leader brings everybody together. You can't compete with yourself. We are one family. 
let's just get this thing done and let's do this work. So henceforth, uh, the issue of, oh, it's not my fault, it's uh, multimedia. It's not my fault, it's uh, the sound, uh, that one. Uh, we don't hear that again, you know, because we have one global, you know, leader. You were going to say something? No, I'm fine. Okay, okay, okay. Um, let's go on, please. Now, uh, somebody's asking here that, um, how do you handle conflicts or disagreements, you know, amongst the team members and so that everybody is able to come back and work together? How do you handle disagreements among team members? Personally, I don't like conflict. I, as a person, I, I really don't like conflict as a person. However, um, when the conflict is is sharp and deep, um, you, we have to resort to the fact that the Bible says, "Cast out the scorner, and strife will cease." There probably is a person within that system that is a problematic individual. And um, that problematic individual has to be identified. And um, 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 either the person changes their ways in, in how they do it, or then that person has to be moved away from that place there um, somewhere else, okay? in terms of that. If there has been sharp conflict and words have been exchanged and the words have caught so deep that um, um, the two people find it hard to be able to, then maybe the people can be moved into other spaces where uh, they can have time to heal before um, uh, we can. But um, 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 conflicts uh, 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 most of the time, we are, we are dealing with somebody who is who is quite problematic within the system. Most of the time. Okay. Um, I, I guess we'll, we'll take two questions and then uh, we'll, we'll let you go. Uh, there's one question that you know for me comes to mind. I wake up every day. And I see Covenant Nation in Ipaja, I see Covenant Nation in Lekki, I see Covenant Nation in, on the mainland, Ireland, then Canada, these and that. And, uh, and a lot of times you, you are also there. You know, I see you minister in this place. I, I see you do a midweek service in Abuja and I'm saying, okay, how does this guy do this? That's number one. How do you do this? And then number two is that how do you ensure that the vision is not diluted? Because I also understand that as an organization begins to grow, there's a tendency for the vision to begin to be diluted. So that when you are in Iponri, for instance, you know, you're ministering, your pastor in Lekki or a pastor in Paja is doing exactly what they are supposed to do so that the vision is not die. How do you do this? Lockdowns to ever open branches because I felt that this was just me. The system, denominational system that I saw wasn't fair. So I, I was very reluctant and I, I didn't want I didn't want to hurt people, so I, I didn't want to do it. So until I came to a place in my consciousness that I felt that this system that I want to create can be a fair system here, then I decided I was going to do it. Now, like you said, I've been, the church has been in existence for 29 years. The, so we have a backlog, fortunately for us, of people that have been in the system for, I mean, people that are pastoring today, maybe the least amount of years that they have spent will be 12 years. Now we are running out of those kinds of people because, I mean, it's the way the backlog is going. So we're running out of it. So we've started training now for people. 
But these are people that are uh, they and they, they I mean they didn't join the church with the mindset, oh this church opens branches, we're gonna be pastors one day. Um if I had to push them to do it. So they were immersed in the vision of the church, and that's what they understand, and that's what they know. And they had been trained over the years. I mean, there was in there was a time within six weeks we had to literally have 32 worship leaders. I mean, 32, the head worship and the assistant. So we had to take 32 people who could lead worship out of, all right, one or two centers to go and do that. So we we, are, we could have that because there were a lot of people that had been inside the system that that over the years and had bought into it. Now, as I said, we are running out of that. I think we'll be out of that in the next one, two years of those kinds of people within the system there who have that inclination. So we have started training. However, what happens in our own system, and I studied it before I started it, and America was the place where I looked at, they said there was a decline in amount of people that were going to churches in America now. Over the last 30 years, there was a decline. But the saving grace in that decline was that um, people were now going into a new type of church, which they would call a campus church. In other words, this campus church was a church where the headquarters beamed the message from the headquarters into the satellite churches there, and the people gathered. Now, so I wondered whether this was going to work for us in Nigeria. But what I now realized was that, so the problem of doctrine issue is eliminated. So the system we have is that the rest them pastors there now, so they ask, so if I'm not preaching on Sunday morning per se, what then am I going to be doing? So the issue of actually building a local congregation, a community of believers, that I discovered that, wait a minute, there's an advantage to this because then the pastor knows my work is not just, it's no longer the preaching. What work will I do? So those churches became real communities because they were building communities. In fact, one of the leaders said, if you stay in the old ones, which were the three that I used to go and preach, all right, physically, and you go to those new churches, you will know that there's that those people, people there are the real, you can't come into that church and leave the church and they won't know your name. They won't know who you are. It is these old ones that you can come to and just leave because they build communities. So they, they speak, they do midweek services, they teach, they train, do workers training, they do everything. But just that Sunday service. So we have been able to at least preserve um, the doctrine there in terms of that. The pastors, all right, are not full-time pastors. They, so they, they have their businesses, they do that. I make sure, at least as of now, that whoever is pastoring is gainfully employed. So they are, they have they have um, they have their sense of identity outside uh, church. So there are many things that they won't even cross their minds, or they won't even, you know, they, they are gainfully employed people. They've been in the system, all right, for years, and and so what they do is they really get into it. They pastor. So if you go into the churches, they are they are real churches. They are communities they built inside those places. They do things that. Um, I will never even occur to me to do. So that's how we've been able to do uh, what we're doing. So we've, we've used the back, backlog of trained people that we are. So as we're going forward in the next two years, then we'll have to um, uh, now start going into people maybe who have been there five years, may have some challenges with that. But let's see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I, and uh, one, one final note. Uh, I know you talked a little bit about it, you know, earlier when you talked about uh, having a leader that is not performing uh, rather than removing him immediately you wait. Do you understand? Now, um, how, how do you manage this in terms of if the leader is not performing, you've had chats with the leader concerning how to you know, get better and, and things and things to do. And there's just no, no change. There's just no change. And you are now left with thinking, I hope this leader will not kill this particular organization, you know, that they're in charge of or, or department. They're in. So how do you undo such people? 
No, the, um, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, if some people didn't leave the church, I don't think, I don't even think we'll, we'll even be close to what we are doing now of, um, of, of going around. So some people have had to, we have had to go to and go say, look, I think nothing can work here. And they, I mean, there's no way I, I, I've tried everything to put you and it's like there's an entitlement mentality and, and all of that, that look, maybe we have come to the end of the road. The only point that I want to bring out is that anytime those kinds of decisions are made, there is a withdrawal that is made on the social capital and emotional investment that the leader has made into the organization. So he has to understand that a withdrawal has been made. So he must make sure that he has he has enough capital within the system of the organization for the people to see that and know that for pastor or for this leader to have made this kind of decision that like somebody said, he said, when I told somebody somebody had to leave, I said, he said, the person said, we, we thought pastor would never pull that trigger. That he's, he said, he said, it's not wrong what he did. It's just that we thought he would never come to the point where he will pull that trigger because this has been long. So there, there must be enough emotional capital within the system for the student to take it and just move on and understand that this must be a situation. Number two, like I said again, um, um, like when I was young, I had appendicitis, which was diagnosed late. And I tell people this, and that so it ruptured. So they, I had to be given antibiotics for one year. And what happened was I managed that thing until for one year, they felt it was now safe to remove the appendix. So I say that when you have people like that, that there's nothing you can do. It's almost like you have to uh, give time and like give um, antibiotics until just manage it until until it becomes apparent that look something has to be done in this particular place so that the people don't because they may not see anything but it can depress their performance in that particular place but there are cases where you look at the person and you know that there's nothing we can do about this but which it just has to we just have to do with the timing and to make sure that we have enough capital within the system here as a leader, that when I make this withdrawal, the people will understand and know that, look, he tried his best, all right, to be able uh, to get that done. And even when a person is, has been, um, I mean, has been let go, so to speak, of it, um, Try as much as possible to, to, I mean, if the person is not a bad person, the person is not an injurious person, but the person just is incompetent and just doesn't have the discipline, just can't handle it, then um, um, we let go of that and, and just find a way we can classify the person without having to cause more damage to the organization. But once we go at it one, two, three, and we know that. You're not pulling your weight. You, you are not going to make an, I mean, we, we, we've opened campuses and I've looked at it and I've said, look, this person is just can't handle this. They've shown by attitude. They've shown by utterances. All right. And we have to make the pull, which I just don't want people to feel that this man, after we get it, can just wake up one morning and just decide he wants to do something. And then we make the pull and find somewhere, maybe inside the organization, that will be more appropriate for you as a person to handle that won't have that um, um, crisis. I, I just believe inside um, an organization, because it's a question of you're making investment, you're making withdrawal, you're making investment, you're making withdrawal, so that the withdrawals are not more than the investments you've made into the people. That's all. But you have to make withdrawals at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I. You know, listening to you, you know, especially on this last question, uh, for me, opened your heart to me that you, you, are, you are a pastor, because I saw that question was difficult for you to really, you know, navigate. And why? Because 
you don't think about the job alone. You think about the people connected with the person and everything. So I saw how difficult. I said, this guy is a pastor, you know. And I said, and and that's and those are things, honestly, that nobody can teach you in an MBA class. And that's just the truth. It, it comes with your heart. It just comes with your heart. Do you understand? I've said to someone before. I say, how do you fire someone? when you will see their children in church next Sunday and they will run up to you and say, hey, Pastor, good to see you. And you just fire their, their dad on Friday. You know, it, 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 it's just tough. It's just gut wrenching, you know. And, you know, at times people don't see that side, you know. But thank you once again, you know, for being part of this conference. Uh, I can say uh, without any shame that I'm also a member of the Covenant Nation. So it's not only... <laughs> Only you that you are, <laughs> you are part of it. I'm also part of the Covenant Nation. Do you understand? Because I love Covenants. They are good Covenants. So, so I know that. <laughs> because there are benefits that come, you know, with Covenants. So, so I'm part of the Covenant Nation as well. You know, uh, once again, we really, really, really appreciate you. And thank you, you know, for your generosity and uh, being part of this year's conference. I will pray that God will continue to strengthen you and uh, enlarge your coast in Jesus' name. Please, our regards to your family and our regards to our fellow covenant nationals or whatever we can call them. You know, thank you. God bless you. Uh,